Thanks very much to Z Prime and the uh, Energy Thought Summit for inviting me here today to talk. Thank you very much, Sherry, as oh, well. My pleasure. Thanks for the warm and welcoming. to me. Yeah, yeah I, I was here yeah. um, a year ago at this event. It was a really fantastic event, and I'm very pleased to get a chance to come again this year. Likewise. So, um, as Erin said, we're going to be talking about decarbonisation, decarbonisation in its broadest sense. Um, I think one of the things that is really kind of important for everybody to be thinking about is the distinction here between electricity and energy, a distinction that I think very often gets blurred. You often hear people talk about 100% clean energy this. Um, California, for instance, you hear about having a 100% clean energy target. Of course, actually what they don't have is a 100% clean energy target, they have a 100% clean electricity target. Um, their electricity they want all to come from clean energy, but that still leaves an enormous amount of energy uh, being used in the state which would not be clean. All the cars that everyone drives, yeah. all the industry and so on, uh, everything else, all the heating in homes, all of those other things um, which are not electric at the moment, uh, or mostly not electric, um, would not be clean even when the state goes to 100% clean electricity, unless they do a lot about it. So that's really, uh, I think, the focus of what I want to talk to you about this morning. Um, perhaps before you get into that, though, could you talk a little bit about your job? I know you're, you're a long-time uh, uh, Austin uh, native, right? That's and, right. And, but not anymore, right? Yeah. And, and now you've uh, moved to the Northeast to, to work for National Grid. Could you tell people maybe a little bit about National Grid and what you sure. do there? Sure. So I made the transition from Austin to Boston about five months ago. It's a big move. Um, went from serving 25 million utility consumers through being the consumer advocate for the state of Texas to being the vice president of regulatory and customer strategy for National Grid. And for those that aren't aware of National Grid, I'm not surprised. I didn't really know that much about the company either when I got the call last summer with an interest in me coming up to interview for them. Uh, it's, a, it's a large utility. We serve 20 million customers in New England and the Northeast, Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island. We're a clean energy company. We are looking at the transition of our customers into a clean energy future. And it's not just electricity. It's also natural gas. And we serve our customers every day. We serve their heating needs and their power needs and, and all the needs that they have on a daily basis, serving their families. We serve the businesses and we serve our industrial customers. And we establish that need-based relationship through our regulatory construct and, and making sure that we meet those needs on a daily basis. Thanks very much. And also, just to clarify the point about the name of the company, National yeah. Grid. So it's a company which is very well known in my country. It's originally uh, from the UK. It, it does in, also own the National Grid of the United Kingdom. And it's, is it headquarters in Warwick. London? In Warwick, indeed. Or Warwick, indeed, as we say in England. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning all kinds of new exactly, pronunciations. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, anyway, thanks very much indeed for that introduction. So, yeah, um, as I said, interested in this point about decarbonisation more broadly. I guess there are two big questions, really. Um, the why and the how. Before we get on to the how, which is, I think, the real meat of it, but let's talk a little bit about the why. Yeah. Um, you're, uh, as you say, um, thinking about decarbonisation, decarbonisation decarbonization strategy. Why are you doing that as a company and why corporately is it an important objective for National Grid? Well, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do by our customers and by our communities and by our stakeholders and by our regulators. And we also have a legal requirement to do so. Um, in all three of our states, we have very aggressive 80 by 50 ambitions. Uh, those include Massachusetts. We have um, the Massachusetts Global Warming Act. In New York, we have Executive Order Number 24. In Rhode Island, we have Resilient Rhode Island. So we have very ambitious and aggressive 80 by 50 climate goals. And by 80 by 50, I mean an 80% reduction in our 1990 emissions by 2050. A lot of other states are also looking at this. We've got California, Oregon, and Washington, and also in the UK and the EU, there are other countries looking at this as well. So my company has taken a very um, strategic pathway approach to looking at our 80 by 50 reduction and what it's going to mean to our customers and how we're going to work together with our communities. Because we can't do it alone. We acknowledge that. We know that. We actually have three different buckets and areas that we're looking at to actually establish this 80 by 50 reduction. On the glide path that we're currently on, we're not going to get there. Indeed. And that was the thing which, uh, when we were talking in preparation for this uh, discussion, you pointed me towards your report, um, what's it called, Northeast 80 by 50 Pathway, which I would very strongly recommend for everybody here to read. You Google Northeast 80 by 50 Pathway, or I think it's on the National Grid website. You can find it all there. I would urge you all to read it because it's a really um, important and very detailed document and, frankly, kind of terrifying, <laughs> because when you look at what needs to be done, you talk about, you set out a, a kind of a short-term pathway, and, and perhaps we talk about that first, but we set out a short-term pathway to 2030, and then you say, even that doesn't get us to where we need to be by 20, 2050, this 80% reduction, which is the ultimate target. And 
I mean, just to think about the, the significance of that, I mean, the point about 80%, why an 80% reduction by 2050, answer essentially that's what the world needs to comply with the Paris Climate Agreement goals, right? If we are going to be serious about limiting the rise in global temperatures to 2 degrees centigrade since pre-industrial times, or rather not even to 2 degrees, but to well below 2 degrees, which is the language they use in the Paris Agreement, then we do need something like that 80% reduction by 2050. But it's an enormous job, right, when you look at everything that has to happen. I mean, well, I mean, to talk, talk about power maybe first, and to think about electricity, because that's what a lot of people think about, and you think about the obvious kind of things, I guess, which is switching out fossil fuels for renewables. Um, what would you need to do on, on that basis, and, and how big a shift do you need there? And you say terrifying. I say, let's be optimistic. <laughs> let's look at all the good things we can do together. Again, we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone as a utility. We can't do it you know, as a group of utilities in the Northeast or New England, or even across the nation or across the world. We have to work with partners. We have to work with our stakeholders. We have to work with our regulators. So on the electric generation side of things, you know, we've made some significant steps. We really are a leader in decarbonizing our electric system in the Northeast. We had the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which was really essential in helping us reduce our emissions by 50% from our 1990 um, emissions, and we are going to look at that and pushing it further. Uh, to reach our 2050 goals, we're thinking it's probably going to take about a 70% reduction in that, and that's going to require the large-scale renewables and other renewable generation to come online quickly. Sorry, a 70% reduction in? The greenhouse gas emissions. Green, right, yeah, got gotcha. you. And so, I mean, again, just looking at a couple of the numbers from that report, um, you talk about solar power, I think, at the moment in the Northeast is less than 1% of electricity, that going to 13%. You talk about wind going from about 2.5% to 19%. This is by 2030, so this is in about a decade. Very big uh, changes. I mean, are those realistic, do you think? Are those achievable? Or, or can you see a path to get to that kind of change by 2030? We're certainly looking at at a lot of the directives of our states. In the Northeast alone, we're looking at adding 80 gigawatts of offshore wind in the next 15 years. And to help that, we actually, my company, National Grid, is looking at investing $3 billion in transmission to help that offshore wind get to the homes and the businesses across our three-state footprint. Right. And then beyond um, just the electricity, as we've said, then there's also heat and there's transport. Thinking about transport, you're thinking about a huge electrification of the fleet, essentially. I mean, I think, again, to stay on that path towards 80% by 2050, by 2030, you're talking about every single car on the roads of the Northeast being electric. That's every light and medium vehicle being electric by 2030. So again, within 10 years. Does that seem uh, achievable? Is that realistic? And if you can't get to that 100%, could you get close to that? It's a high hurdle. It's definitely an aspiration. It's something that our company, in doing the modeling and the analysis that actually leads up to the 80 by 50 pathway report, it's, it's important to think about what is necessary and how are we going to get there. So 100 million electric vehicles on the roads in the Northeast by 2030. That's 100% of our vehicle sales being electric vehicle, light duty vehicles by 2028. That's less than 10 years. Like, how are we going to get there? Um, there are three areas that we're focused on. Of course, we want awareness. Customers, Nowadays, they, they have fears and concerns about electric vehicle. I mean, there's range anxiety. We hate to say that word. But, you know, I actually, the one good thing about my company is they're very progressive in educating not only their employees, but also their communities. We actually have a really good program at National Grid that incents our employees to go out and purchase an electric vehicle. It's the first thing I did when I joined the company was purchase an electric vehicle. What have you got? I actually have a Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, which I can plug in on a Sunday night and I get back and forth to the office all week without ever... Up I was going to say, and, and, yes. and you like it? How, I love it, it, and it's great for my family, and it's, it's perfect, perfect sites. So, you know, there's a lot of incentives, there's a lot of e rebates, there's a lot of information out there that we need to educate customers about. The other area is access. We need charging infrastructure. We don't have the charging infrastructure in place to actually get people from place to place. I have one of my colleagues, he actually, you know, he has a smaller electric vehicle, and he has to get to Albany quite often, and he has to, you know, pull over and, and sit there for an hour and get his coffee and get his snack before he goes to the Capitol to meet with his, his other colleagues. So we have to ensure that the, the infrastructure's in place. And one of the things that National Grid is doing is they're making those proposals in a lot of the rate case filings across our three-state region. In fact, we had $37 million approved in a Plan 1 EV program that'll get 2,000 charging ports across the state of New York. And we have a second one that we 
have filed a phase two program that looks at putting 18,000 charging ports across New York, and that'll be $167 million if approved by our commission. In Rhode Island, we've also proposed putting $10 million worth of investments in electric vehicle charging, and we're waiting for uh, more information from one of our other states on, on what needs to be done next for that area. So it's gonna be education, it's gonna be awareness, it's gonna be accessibility, and it's gonna be affordability too. We're gonna need to make sure that these cars and vehicles are affordable for some of our low to moderate income in all homes and sizes. And we're also gonna to need to make sure that the electric vehicle infrastructure charging stations are gonna be free or low cost to ensure that people can get from place to place. Right. And, and does that mean they will need to be supported by tax breaks and rebates and other kinds of things? Yes. Or, I mean, do, do you expect that the cost will just come down to the point, because obviously costs have come down, innovation has driven them down, mass production of electric vehicles has driven those costs down, uh, that's kind of expected to continue. People say that electric vehicles will carry on getting cheaper, mm -hmm. but you think they might not get cheaper enough to the point where they will just be the more competitive option, even without subsidy, tax breaks, whatever. Uh, each of our states do offer incentives and tax breaks. Um, I certainly, in, in Massachusetts, for example, they give a $2,500 rebate for anybody who goes out and purchases an electric vehicle. Again, my company also gave us an incentive and a rebate for purchasing a vehicle. There's a lot of free infrastructure charging stations throughout the three-state region. Anytime I go to a government agency or government office, I can always plug in my vehicle. So I think there are a lot of incentives and breaks out there currently, and those will probably need to be continued in the foreseeable future if we're going to meet our 20 by 50 goals. Right. Got it. And what about the uh, effect on the grid in terms of, um, I mean, you mentioned just infrastructure and places for people to plug in. Do you need a lot more infrastructure in the grid? Because presumably you get more load on the grid then if everyone's having to charge up their vehicles all the time. And do you need more generation capacity as well? I mean, it's a, it's a whole kind of electricity system, right? I always think about this when you think about um, internal combustion engine cars. Um, the, the energy system there is not just the, the engine there. It is the... Uh, marketing, it's the gas station, it's the people who bring the uh, fuel to the gas station, it's the refinery where the fuel is refined from crude oil, it's the oil industry which is exploring and developing oil fields in order to make, you know, it's a complete, in the same way, right, for an electric vehicle, again, there's a whole kind of supply chain that goes right back up to, to where the power is generated and then maybe the fuel that supplies the power plant. When you look through the implications of all that, for you and for, for the rest of the electricity system, how much of a difference does it make? We're certainly looking and modeling what that's going to be necessary in the future. Right now, again, it's so insignificant, but as it ramps up... But if you had 100%, if every single... If we get to 100%, then we certainly are going to have to be prepared for that. We're going to have to have the necessary build-out of infrastructure on the distribution system as well as the transmission system and ensuring the generation's in place. Another option we're looking at, too, is having time-varying rates for electric vehicle use. So that would allow folks to go home, plug in at night, and they would know what time to plug in in their car to get the, the lowest rate, and, and that would also incent customers to utilize the, the charging at home and, and ports with that rate policy. Sure. And then the, the other part of the, the other leg of the three legged stool, then after electricity and transport, is heat. And clearly, heat a, a hugely important thing uh, in the Northeast. Um, knowing this now as being a, a New Yorker <laughs> myself for the past nine years, yeah. as I have been, certainly, and you'll be appreciating that yes, after, after the winter. Um, and a lot of people then use oil still for yes, home heating do. in that region. Um, there's been a shift towards gas, but again, if you want to decarbonize that, you're gonna to have to do a whole lot more, right? I mean, how, how do you see that as working? Yeah, and, and the whole oil concept was really new to me. Um, moving from Texas to the Northeast, uh, I've been looking for a new home, and there's a lot of oil heated homes, and it's, it's the kerosene, it's propane, and it's fuel oil. So we're really looking at oil to gas conversions, but not just oil to gas, natural gas conversions. We're also looking at renewable natural gas, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So I think it's important to look at those conversions as an option. Just by switching your home from oil to gas, it reduces your emissions um, by 30%. Some other areas that we're looking at uh, relate to energy efficiency, really tightening up buildings and homes to ensure that they're the most efficient. And you know, we're looking at providing ground source and air source heat pumps. Um, it's interesting, though, because one of my my colleagues, she purchased an air source heat pump the other day, but it caused her electric bills to skyrocket so high, she actually turned it off and went back to her fuel oil. So it doesn't always serve the purpose. So when we hear electrify everything in New England and the Northeast, we can worry about that because ultimately we're going to be worried about the consumers and their, their, their total energy wallet and what those, what those bills are going to look like if we're electrifying everything. We see a sustainable place for natural gas and its role in working together with electricity and having kind of this hybrid approach going forward. 
And you mentioned heat pumps. Heat pumps are one of those technologies that never, I never really understand how they work. It always seems like magic to me. How can it kind of, <laughs> like, catches heat and, and brings it into your home? And, I mean, when people explain it as being like a refrigerator in reverse, I can sort of just about get that. But am I right in thinking that you need, that that really only works in houses if you've got a bit of a yard or a garden or something? You need some space there. So, like, I mean, I live in an apartment building. Yeah. I'm, I'm never going to have a heat pump, presumably, in, in that. There's no way that could be made to work for me. Is that right? But there might be other options if you're living in a multifamily dwelling. There might be geothermal options, but again, some of those require lots of land and right. space around the actual exterior of the building. So I mean, there's really going to be um, a necessity to look at every viable option out there, which is really why we are looking at the future of heat from a natural gas standpoint of if we could do the oil to gas conversions and provide some green gas tariffs and some green energy options. I mean, folks who live here in Texas, you know you can go out and shop the market if you live in the ERCOT footprint and purchase up to 100% renewable electricity. We want that same option for people to go out and purchase 100% renewable natural gas. Right, because the other thing, of course, that happens in the Northeast a lot is there's a lot of resistance to gas pipelines, mm -hmm. and people are, yes. um, for all the well-known reasons, people are objecting to the shale industry. Um, people say that if you build fossil fuel infrastructure, you kind of lock the country into that, and then if you're building a pipeline which uh, have a useful life of 40 years or 60 years or whatever it is, that makes it harder then to, to move over to renewables. So people stop pipelines being built, which means that particularly in the Northeast where you're kind of at the, the end of the pipeline, as it were, um, you can't get enough gas often, and that creates problems for people who might want to switch for oil to gas. And increasingly, that's going to be a problem. Uh, and the price of gas also goes sky high in the winter, and people have to you have to import LNG from Russia yeah. because you can't get enough uh, American gas there. Is that? Uh, I mean, how do you think about that problem? I mean, is is that a case of sort of when you see that opposition to pipelines? Is that a case of the the best being the enemy of the good? That you know, there's the, some improvement you could get by that shift from gas to oil, which would be worth taking um, and building the pipeline for that reason? Or do you think that maybe there's a, uh, a justification for not building the pipelines and, as I say, trying to go to these kind of carbon-free rather than lower carbon options? Well, I think there's an opportunity for us to educate our stakeholders, especially our environmental groups. We, there are a lot of gas capacity constraints throughout the Northeast and New England, and we certainly have a lot of environmental groups that oppose any kind of new pipeline build-out, but we've really reached our hands out to let them know these are some of the innovative options that we're looking at. These are some of the ways that we can decarbonize our heating system and decarbonize our gas network. One thing I mentioned was renewable natural gas. We've actually been operating um, the Staten Island landfill in downstate New York for about 30 years now. And what we do is we take biomass and we convert it into pipeline quality natural gas, which is, has a much lower carbon footprint than regular natural gas. We're going to be filing a rate case at the end of the month. It's also looking at another project, the Newtown Creek project, which is actually in New York City, that's going to be doing the same thing, taking wastewater, taking uh, food waste from the city of New York and converting it into this pipeline quality natural gas. Yeah, well, I was going to ask about that. So in terms of the sort of the streams then where you get your, your green natural gas, renewable natural gas, so that, is that sort of just like regular household waste? You need waste to be sorted out, so you have specifically food waste, is it, from wastewater and you know, sewage and so on? Or what, what, are the, what are the crucial sources here? So the feedstocks, feedstocks can be from a numerous um, list of items. It could be dairy manure, it could be biomass, like um, it could be wastewater, it could be food waste from landfills, but what's necessary is to get larger producers of these to come together, and we also have to have interconnection guidelines so those developers and producers of it know how to connect to our system, and we know what we're getting. We know that it's the cleanest source and that it's been properly um, you properly converted into pipeline quality natural gas. And in terms of the uh, potential supply, given the huge demand for gas across the region, is there, is there enough trash, enough waste of all kinds in order to generate the gas that would be needed to meet that demand? And, that, and that's the hope, and that's the question there. So we started looking at this in 2010. We actually produced a white paper on renewable natural gas and, and what the future of it was for our national grid. We worked with the American Gas Association in 2011 to produce another white paper to look more of a national standpoint. It could be anywhere from 10 to 40% of our supply needs on a very aggressive basis. Uh, right now, we're working with the American Gas Foundation to work on an updated study to determine whether or not how much uh, capacity renewable natural gas could actually take on our pipeline system and how, how it could impact our systems as well. Okay, thank you. Now, we're running a little bit low on time, but I wanted to give people a chance to un ask some questions if there's anyone in the hall. I think we've got some mics. Does anyone? Yeah, let's, I can see one there. Thanks very much. Hi, Sherry, and welcome back. Hi. 
Um, you know, you spent a lot of time here in Texas, working on Texas and around Texas regulatory environments, and now you're in the Northeast. You know, we see as in this changing energy economy and opportunities that it's difficult to be homogenous. There's different, you know, characteristics, more sun shines here than maybe in the Northeast and so on. What are some of the, now that you've seen some of the regulatory um, kind of initiatives up in the Northeast, you know, what are, could you compare and contrast with Texas a little bit? Any, any new pearls for Texas? Any new pearls for the Northeast from Texas? I'd be interested in hearing about that. Yeah, so there's a lot of differences, of course. Um, you know, I'm operating in three different states, Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island. The utility commissions are apples and oranges. They meet very differently. They, they have open meetings. They have ex parte like our utility commission does, but it's just different. And the, the way they deliberate and how they do it and how they put together their orders just Apples and oranges, totally different. Um, one of the things I like about the Texas market is the uh, competitive retail market. Uh, I really enjoyed being able to go and shop for my electric provider. They have a little bit of that up there, but it's not as, um, there's not as many options. So for example, I can go and shop in Texas and I can find an eight cent rate and I can lock it in for a year. There it's, you know, you can find a supplier and it's a portion of your bill, but you still have another portion of your bill. So it's just a little different how it's done there. Um, I do like their aggressive um, 80 by 50 approach. I think Austin Energy is, of course, one of the most cutting edge utilities in the state of Texas. And so it's kind of nice to come home and, and see my friends from there. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that Austin Energy is already doing, which they can share with their Texas utilities and what they're doing. And I think there's an opportunity here for us at Natural Grid to come and talk to Texas utilities as well. I've already reached out to several of my Texas utilities for any kind of assistance. We just don't have smart meters in the Northeast, which was shocking to me. We've had smart meters in Texas for 10 years. And I'm one of those geeky customers who actually likes to see how much energy I'm using on a weekly basis and did I use less last week and how does that compare to my neighbors? And I get up there and I have no insight. I get a bill in this tiny little 800 square foot apartment for $120. I'm going, what happened? So I think there's a lot of um, home energy management, smart meter information. There's a lot of you know, technology that we can share with our New England counterparts and that New England can share with Texas as well. Thank you. Um, anyway, yeah, one there, and then we may have time for just one other after. Hi, Sherry. Morgan Pitts with the Energy Co-op in Philadelphia. We're a retail supplier of renewable natural gas, uh, so I was really excited to hear that mentioned as a topic here. Um, I'd really be, I heard you said about uh, needing standards for you know, injection quality uh, renewable gas, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, policies at the state or federal level that sure. would really help increase the adoption of RNG and get to that goal that you guys outlined. I would be happy to. So um, actually, I spoke about this topic at the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners in uh, February at the Gas Committee. And there's a lot of things that regulators can do to help progress renewable natural gas. First is education. Just a lot of people don't understand what it is or understand how it could be beneficial in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Also, the interconnection, very, very important. Important. Um, I have a team in my, um, with my utility that's working on interconnection guidelines for the state of New York. Those should be coming out in the next two to three weeks, I'm told, and those will be um, kind of a standard that can be utilized across the country. And then another area we're talking about is how do you compensate utilities or users of RNG for the heating quality of it? You have the renewable um, energy credits, the RENs, I guess, for the transportation segment. You have California has the LCFS where they can actually credit for RNG. And we don't know that we want to have all of this great RNG on our system that's benefiting our customers and selling off those credits to California. Why can't we keep it in our states and actually have that benefit utilized through our region as well? So finding a way to compensate for heating, that's a really good goal for us to have. One big question that is on everybody's minds is who owns the data? So you talk about uh, smart grid data. Utilities or customers or little both? Well, it's easy to answer in Texas. Uh, <laughs> we have a statute that says the customer owns the data. In New York, because we don't have smart meters deployed yet, that is an area that we are looking at. Our regulators are very interested in ensuring that the customers have that right to the data. Of course, third parties are very interested in getting the data because they feel like they can use that for, as a competitive tool. So, you know, we are at the will of our regulators and at the will of our legislators. So we are, we've made these filings. We filed for our AMI deployment in November and 
New York. Uh, we're looking at filing for an AMI deployment in Rhode Island in June. So those are questions that are going to be discussed in each of the filings and, and hopefully answered throughout the testimony and throughout the regulatory proceeding. Thank you very much. Just about what we've got time for, I just wanted to ask one final question myself. You, uh, you challenged what I said. I used the word terrifying when I, I described this prospect uh, ahead of us and what needs to be done. You rejected that. You said it, we shouldn't think about it as terrifying. We should think about the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, could you just explain you know, what you mean by that? And I mean, how hopeful are you we will actually evolve on this path? For those of you that know me, I'm an optimist. I always want to you know, wish for the right thing. And, and working with this company, it's like they do the right thing. Um, just even calling people before I even accepted the job with National Grid, it's like I know that they're progressive, I know they're cutting edge, and I know they've got smart people in place who are going to be working towards that. So when it comes to electric transportation, again, educating customers, making them aware of all the options that are out there, making sure it's affordable, making sure that there's incentives and rebates, making sure it's accessible, ensuring that there's electric infrastructure charging stations out there, whether it's utility owned or third party owned, trying to get out there and be helpful in whatever way you can. Future of heat, again, ensuring that we have methane reductions. Uh, we've, we've looked at every option for cleaning up the gas system if, you, if, you, if it's perceived as dirty at all, and, and looking at the renewable natural gas, uh, green gas tariffs, um, looking at geothermal options, looking at pilots and demonstrations, working with our academic partners. We're working with Stony Brook Institute on a power to gas demonstration. We're working with NREL, which is one of the labs with DOE on this power to gas demonstration as well reaching out to every partner we can think of in the industry and bringing the brightest minds together to hopefully make that change and get to our 2050 goals. Sounds great. Thanks very much. Let's hope we can come back here then in 10 years' time and you can talk about all the fantastic progress you've made. Can't wait. It'd be Excellent. great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.